From the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. So there's no right to be forgotten. All we're dealing with is how do we handle difficult, wrong, inaccurate, inconvenient, public information. This is your host, Scott Bertram, and that's John J. Miller, director of the Dow Journalism Program here at Hillsdale College. We'll talk with John today about the so-called right to be forgotten and some newspapers and publications across the United States that are adopting such a policy. John, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Scott. Talking today about uh, a story I saw earlier in the year, and apparently it's uh, I want to call it a trend, but it is developing out there. A, a right to be forgotten policy in journalism. The Chicago Sun Times has a new policy. So does the Boston Globe, the Plain Dealer in Cleveland, the Atlanta Journal Constitution. What is a right to be forgotten policy? Scott, I want to start off by saying there's no such thing as a right to be forgotten. This is the kind of rights talk that we can sink into where everything is a right and so forth. But there is a notion here, an important idea here worth talking about, which is the desire for people to have information removed or attempted to have removed from the internet. And it can be maybe inaccurate information. It can be things they just don't like about themselves, perhaps. And so there's a response to this, both at the government level around the world, and also at an individual level, maybe with an individual publication, do people have a quote unquote right to be forgotten or at least a claim that perhaps they should have an ability to have information deleted, erased, eliminated, so forth? So these newspapers are saying uh, for certain people in certain situations, they will remove these stories for various reasons we'll talk about in, in a moment. Are, are, are these stories generally deleted entirely? Are they simply removed from being searchable? And is there really a difference in this day and age? It can be all of the above. And so if we think back to what journalism in the media was like before the internet, if a newspaper printed an inaccuracy, the next day or the next week, you might get a correction published in the newspaper. And that often feels inadequate to the person who had the original complaint, but that really that's your only recourse. Yeah. And so there'd be this kind of give and take and, and the correction would appear and, and the record is corrected, but the whole record still exists, including the original mistake, which is forever on printed paper, maybe later on a microfilm or whatever. With the internet, you have a unique ability to take information down, just to remove a website, or maybe delete a line from a story. And so it's also true that there's really no such thing as completely eliminating anything from the internet. Right. But you can certainly make it harder to find. You can you can take it off your website. You can make it unsearchable. There are lots of things that an individual publication can do to correct the record. And so lots of publications have their own policies for how to deal with these kinds of problems. Some will make a correction and then note that a correction has been made at the bottom of a web page. Others will just fix it and you'll never know. If you go back to it thinking, I want to find that error again, <laughs> it won't be there. Where did it go? It has vanished. Uh, there may be f- ways of recovering that if you're especially good and diligent at, at digging, but the idea is to make it harder to have information uh, live forever. Talking to John J. Miller about the, uh, the quote-unquote right to be forgotten in some journalistic corners, the Sun-Time policy says if you're the subject of a past article about an arrest or accusation that was later disproved, dismissed, or expunged, you can fill out this form, they'll go through a process. So that concept, is that something worth considering, exploring for journalistic outlets? Yeah, I think that's reasonable, and I think different outlets should have their own policies for this kind of thing, because sometimes a publication makes an egregious error and that ought to get corrected, or at least we have the technological capability to to correct it and make it go away mostly. And so individual publications that have policies like this ought to look at what they can do and probably handle them on a case-by-case basis because circumstances matter, particulars matter, and so on. Where this gets difficult is 
not when you're dealing with, you know, a false accusation or a, a case of libel or near, li- near libel or something like that. What if there's something just kind of inconvenient? Mm-hmm. You know, I wrote a letter to the editor 10 years ago in which I supported Democrats and today I'm a Republican. Sure. Or I used to be for free trade, now I'm against it. Where your view has changed and and you want that to go away, that becomes a bigger kind of problem. And of course, we're sympathetic to this kind of thing at a certain level because we live in an age of cancel culture and the idea that your past words can be used against you. And maybe you're trying for a promotion at a law firm and you're embarrassed by a thing you said in a newspaper five years ago and would like that to go away. That raises a different kind of concern because we're not dealing with accuracy or inaccuracy. We're dealing with inconvenience. And that's where I think probably we should draw a line. There mm-hmm. may be circumstances that are that are so important that that you need to you need to have the, the ability to use judgment and prudence in individual situations. But as a general matter, that's a part of the record and probably should remain so. Who's ineligible to apply? Again, under the Sun-Times standards in Chicago, it says current or past elected or public officials or people seeking public office, with the rationale being that we should know everything possible about people who want to represent us. Should that or should that not extend to other professions in which we are entrusting people? I'm thinking specifically perhaps about teachers. We entrust them with our children for hours a day, weeks on end. Should they be eligible to have things like this expunged from the record? That's a great question. It shows why these are so hard to adjudicate. And this is all connected to a kind of right to privacy, right? This is not a right to privacy because a right to privacy involves uh, the 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 the, the uh, information that has not already become public. Usually, when we think about a right to privacy, uh, do do public figures have a different kind of right to privacy than 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 private citizens? And and the answer is is yes. They get more scrutiny because they have entered the the public arena, and that comes with a kind of cost here in a sense, or at least a vulnerability. The the right to be forgotten, the quote unquote right to be forgotten is is about information that's already public. Mm-hmm. It's already been released. It's already been out there. And now it's it's removal. And that's a different matter. It is harder and it requires just good judgment from the people who are involved in these kinds of decisions. In the discussion about this sort of maneuver by by publications, I, I, I can't help but think of the NCAA and what they do with championships and, and games that are won by programs that are then deemed ineligible. They did something wrong. They were recruiting violations. We, we strip all this from their record. Okay, but we all saw it happen. Those games were played. There was a winner and loser. And the NCAA wants to tell us that never happened. Are you concerned about that in the realm of journalism in which something did happen? There was an accusation. There was some sort of indictment. And the paper's saying, well, no, it, it didn't really happen. Well, an indictment is a public record. That's important that we would know that there's a particular legal move and you can presumably read the full thing. You can find out what happened. Was there a case where charges dropped and so on? And that feels like it ought to be a part of 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 the record, but it also shows why there's no right to be forgotten. You can't tell me to forget that a team won a championship and then had its championship removed. I can't forget that. I might try to forget that. Yeah. I might want to forget that, but I can't forget that. So there's no right to be forgotten. All we're dealing with is how do we handle difficult, wrong, inaccurate, inconvenient public information? Do we have technological tools that allow us to maybe improve the public record, I think is is one way to to look at it. And, and the best way to handle this is to let individual publications, their publishers, their editors, deal with this problem on a case-by-case basis. So, so far here in the U.S., it is a, a private matter. These are private institutions, newspapers, outlets deciding this is going to be our policy. Elsewhere, though, around the globe, governments have become involved or want to become involved, perhaps, in the EU and a few other places. What are uh, governments outside the U.S. doing on this topic? Well, the the European Union has some rules regarding this. Argentina and the Philippines apparently have some rules as well. And I'm not I'm not an expert on on what they're saying. But what the trend is, is for governments to get 
involved in this? And should we have public agencies making rules that that publications and websites and so forth then will have to live by? That strikes me as a problem. That strikes me as a, a difficult thing to do and might just make the mess even worse. Just curious, you've been writing for a long time, not calling you old, but have you ever had someone reach out to you about something you personally have written and said, please eliminate this, please get rid of this, or I didn't mean what I told you? Well, I've never had a mistake in anything I've ever written, Scott, so we've never had to, we've never had to deal with this. This is a th- completely theoretical, theoretical question. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah p- people complain and they ask for something to be completely unreasonable requests for information to be dropped. I mean, you know, I didn't mean that or or sometimes I didn't say that, but but mostly it's in 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 the realm of this is not something I like mm-hmm. and I didn't want it in quite this form and my answer to that usually is well 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 tough luck, but but you know, people make I think reasonable claims from time to time on these grounds and we've got to listen and and think about it and if we have technological tools that allow for an improvement of the public record, then maybe we can, on a case-by-case basis and using really sound discrimination, make good judgments. We're talking so much about being forgotten, the quote-unquote right to be forgotten. We probably should think a little bit about forgiveness. And if someone says something that was inconvenient or provocative or, or, or something – Maybe not hold it against them. Maybe ask, well, why did you change your mind or have you changed your mind about such a thing? And and maybe forgive a person who has said a bad thing rather than cancel that person. And if, if we have more of a culture of forgiveness, maybe we don't need to worry as much about this idea of the right to be forgotten. John J. Miller is director of the Dow Journalism Program here at Hillsdale College as we discuss the uh, right to be forgotten, quote unquote, policies from some publications you can go back and read about the Sun-Times uh, policy at uh, suntimes.com. John, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thanks, Scott. Up next, Megan Basham joins us. She's from the Daily Wire. She'll discuss a lecture given here on Hillsdale's campus and her upcoming book, Bad Shepherds. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hey, it's Scott Bertram, and I've got a challenge for you today. Become a better educated American citizen. And to help you do just that, we at Hillsdale College have our free online courses available for all who wish to learn. Our challenge? Take just one of our courses. There are so many to choose from. You can discover the beauty of the Bible in the Genesis story, study the writings of C.S. Lewis, or explore the true meaning of America in Constitution 101. We have dozens more to choose from, and all these self-paced free courses feature Hillsdale faculty and scholars, many you've heard on this podcast. So visit hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E, and pick one of the more than 30 free Hillsdale courses. I hope you'll accept my challenge. Pick whichever course you like and become a more educated citizen today. Go to hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to check out podcast.hillsdale.edu. That's the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. Find older episodes of this program, plus other fine Hillsdale podcasts like The Larry Arn Show, Imprimus, and the Hillsdale College Online Courses Podcast, all at podcast.hillsdale.edu. We're joined by Megan Basham. She is culture reporter at The Daily Wire. You can find her work at dailywire.com and on X, formerly Twitter, at Meg Basham. Megan, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I've loved seeing your campus. Your work at The Daily Wire, people might first think of The Daily Wire as Ben Shapiro, Mm -hmm. Michael Knowles, and Andrew Clavin, and these very heavily opinionated people. You are on the reporting side. Mm. Why is what you do at The Daily Wire so important? 
Right. And I think that there's a lot of confusion sometimes with that. So particularly on the program, I tend to work on the most, which is Morning Wire, which is our non-opinion daily news podcast. We really do give you facts on that show, uh, not feelings, but (laughs) facts, not feelings, but not opinion. And you know, part of why that's so important is I think that we've reached a point where you see so much of what used to be the mainstream journalism, mainstream outlets that we used to see, we tend to prefer to call them legacy Mm -hmm. because there's a question of just how mainstream they are, that they no longer really do that anymore. They don't do unopinionated news themselves, even if it's not always branded as that. Sure. So that really is something that we've made an effort to do at the Daily Wire, in part just for business reasons, that there is a huge opening there for people who want that kind of news. And we've seen, man, just a huge receptiveness to the work we do, even from people who might be left-leaning or certainly moderate. And so I, I think it shocks some people to know that, you know, there are media watchdog groups that are out there rating our product actually balanced. <laughs> so, and that's its purpose, you know, is 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 really to get at what the truth of these stories is. And I think you're just seeing a huge audience receptiveness to that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but sure. really it's as so much of the media has lost the fundamentals of journalism, somebody needs to step in and pick those fundamentals back up. You're in the midst of a book on religion. You're giving a lecture, a talk here at Hillsdale, uh, also on religion. Your Twitter X bio says, unabashed church lady. <laughs> yes. But that wasn't always the case. You you have written about a time when you fell away from the church, you threw off the moral restraints of your Mm. Christian upbringing. Mm -hmm. Looking back, how did that happen? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll start by saying I had a very different college experience than probably uh, your average Hillsdalian. Uh, is that what you guys go by, Hillsdalian? Hillsdalian, yeah. yeah. Yep. I, I got it. Right. Yep. Awesome. Mr. Gander, <laughs> Hillsdalian. Yeah. yeah. I like that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, really in college, I, you know, just kind of embraced the hedonistic um, atmosphere of my state college in Arizona. I was at Arizona State, <laughs> which has been, I think, nominated to Playboy's Best Party School, a record five times, something like that. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of contributed to that atmosphere. And it, which sounds funny now, but, you know, looking back, it wasn't funny. It was it was a pretty miserable time, actually, when you separate out sort of those frenzied periods of fun from mm-hmm. what it's doing to your soul. It's, it's not funny. And it was actually, <laughs> I was in a English lit class where I was reading a, a an original, the Vulgate cycle of Lancelot. And it's a lot to go into in a brief interview, but I'll just say I was surprisingly convicted by it. And mm-hmm. it sort of awakened my uh, very darkened conscience to what I had lost from my upbringing. And I came back to the church and I met my husband in the church. And um, I, I mean, I will say I, I just kind of limped my way back into the <laughs> church and they were there to really pick me up. And give me the grounding and the teaching that I needed to to become strong, to uh, to really start to look at what I was doing in my life and to feel a a holy sense of conviction about it so that I could repent and seek forgiveness. And yeah, so that was really what turned things around for me was that church, that particular community that surrounded me. And um, that's probably why I became so passionate about <laughs> reporting on the church. You, you wrote that church not only sets you on a path to sanctification, but it also equipped you to be a productive citizen and a person fit for self-government. Those are big things. Yep. Why was church able to do that for you when nothing else did? Well, that's a miraculous part of it, right? That it is not a self-help program. It's something truly transformative in redemption. It's not, you know, we're just going to give you a little program that's going to make you better on the outside. It it is really soul transforming. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, as you read that, I'm like, you should just go read this essay that's in First Things because I am really good on paper. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yes, I mean, and, and I think as you look back and you see the founder's talk about these things, they knew that. that I, I mean, it's become a cliche, but the John Adams quote that, you know, government only fit for a moral and religious people, mm-hmm. it's true because if you do not have a moral people, then they are given to that sort of hedonism and self-interest. You can only have a people who um, 
even if it's cultural, I think, you know, on the one hand, yes, you have a lot of truly redeemed people, but then you have a lot of people who also, because of that salt and light, their culture is preserved. (laughs) And if we're not, you know, performing that preservative role, then you see just a very quick cultural degradation. And I think that's Mm -hmm. where we are. And so for that reason, you learn to care about family. You learn to care about the people in your community. You have a sense of taking care of others and giving of yourself in a way that you don't when you're largely self-interested. And then you can get into a really quick cycle that I think we're seeing of grievance and how have I been wronged Mm -hmm. other than how have I wronged and been forgiven. So it just really transforms your focus. Talking with Megan Basham of The Daily Wire at dailywire.com. She's here on Hillsdale's campus giving a talk Bad Shepherds, How Evangelical Leaders Are Smuggling Leftism Into the Church. We hear advice often, go go find a church, go mm. to church, get to church. Should we be more specific with that request? <laughs> yes, you should. In fact, uh, you know, kind of one of the big things I close out this upcoming book that I have coming out, hopefully in the new year here, is don't give your attention and your money to those who are uh, using their pulpits and their ministry platforms to, you know, push political agendas rather than teaching scripture and sound doctrine. And we're seeing a ton of that. And yes, do go to church, but be discerning in the churches that you're going to. And I also want to say that, look, I don't think, you know, every pastor who gives himself over to maybe fear of man or compromise with the trends is necessarily a wolf or something like that. You can't go to this church. I have a good friend who was sort of telling me, after going to some churches where there were some very unsound things happening, he went to a church that was eh, sort of not sure what to think of like the Black Lives Matter movement. And he challenged them. He talked to these pastors, look, they they don't know everything. And sometimes you may have more information about that. And he very charitably, they went to coffee, they talked it over. And that church kind of came to see, not like we're going to tell you what to think about this issue, but you know what? Let's just preach the word. (laughs) Let's stick to scripture. And if we do that, that is going to be the best thing we can do to help people know what they should do with their politics and with, you know, particular social questions. We don't need to dictate to this from on high. What we can do is let their minds be saturated with scripture and that's going to do its work. I don't need to do that. How widespread is this? And why are some churches pastors more concerned about those sorts of things rather than the the sins and vices from which we are truly in danger? It is a very widespread problem. I mean, I can tell you that it doesn't matter the denomination or the part of the country that a person may be in or the socioeconomic class. I am hearing about this from everyone, from Southern Baptists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Lutherans. If you look around, it is a very widespread problem. And part of why it is a widespread problem is because there are some very powerful actors and special interests looking to bring it to your church. So I don't want to discount the fact that there is a lot of money being spent to co-opt your churches and your pastors into getting with the program. Now, your own pastor, you know, he's probably not a part of that program, but he's being influenced by not talking your pastor, Scott, right, but yeah, that, yeah, not personally. The general you, yeah, <laughs> that that he's being influenced by the people who are setting the discourse, like say your Christianity Today magazine or some of these large ministries and institutions like uh, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, who, you know, they're the lobbying arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. So all of these groups have a tendency to shape how we're talking about various policy issues. And they are very interested in co-opting evangelicals to sign on to various progressive programs. And so that's what what we're seeing. And you have people who may not be that discerning, or they may just go, gosh, I'm so tired of being criticized on abortion and, you know, gay marriage or homosexuality or the transgender movement or whatever it may be. So if there's something that you can sort of glom onto and put a Christian shine on it, they may want to do that. Like something like climate change becomes Mm -hmm. creation care. And suddenly it's not just, hey, you know, I don't know to what degree climate change is human cause. And I'll just let all of you parishioners go out and make that decision for yourself. No, it becomes our church is going to do a Bible study Mm -hmm. now on creation care. And we're going to have Bible studies that we get together and sort of 
wedge verses into meaning that we have to lobby for fossil fuel le- regulation. And I'm not kidding. That kind of stuff is going on. You see the same thing with subjects like immigration. I, I mean, I could go on and on. You know, there was a lot of CRT. That's kind of died out a little bit now. But yeah, so I, I think your question was, why is it happening so much? And it's because there, there's some very powerful people who want it to be happening. And there's some compromised people who want to help them. Uh, you wrote in that First Things piece that evangelical leaders are being deceived, creating an extra biblical class of sins in uh, progressivism, which I love that line. Is is there a sense that there's a desire on behalf of the government to, and I'll use the word, infiltrate churches and leverage them to enact policy goals? Is that what's happening here on some level? Yes. <laughs> Short answer. Yes, that's absolutely happening. Um, that's not in question. In fact, I can tell you uh, just like a couple of weeks ago, I watched a presentation from the head of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric is it Association? Uh, Administration. NOAA. Okay. Administration. Yeah. Thank you. NOAA, who directly said, you know, in the past, we haven't made churches a priority getting involved with them. We're going to change that going forward, particularly on the climate change issue that we are going to make that a part of our program to work with faith-based groups to help them educate their people on um, how important this is and how important it is to address it. Well, look, that, that's sort of generic, but we know what that means, right? It means not drilling. It means you know, make, levying higher taxes on gas, joining the Paris Accords, things like this. So, I mean, <laughs> so they talk about it very vaguely, but it has real policy meaning. And on top of that, I mean, I can give you just one anecdote. I mean, last year, one of the large seminaries in the Southern Baptist Convention. And for those who don't know this, they educate a plurality of all Protestant ministers in any denomination. So good odds that, you know, even if you're Anglican or non-denominational or whatever it may be, your pastor may have gone through one of these seminaries. They had a speaker in who literally, not exaggerating, encourage the students to buy carbon credits to show their love for creation. And I I watched it and went, you're selling indulgences. That's what's happening right here. So that was shocking to me to go, we're going to have a seminary professor come in and tell them that, you know, the best thing to do for your Christian witness is to buy carbon credits. To me, that that should not be a thing that you go to seminary to learn. (laughs) How to, how to buy your carbon credit indulgences. There's a there's a fervor with which many climate activists act that is often compared to religion, a religious fervor that they have. Does the left understand that power? And is that one of the reasons they're, I mean, some on the left would have very bad things to say about churches, but they understand the power of what church can accomplish by focusing energy and that fervor and if they can if they can change the focus away from those things that again really are in danger of harming us to these things these other things they understand how that power can be Mm. leveraged right yeah and i would say you actually see a very sort of distinct tipping point maybe in the early 2000s where you started to see some of these progressive groups like george soros's open society foundation talk about faith in a very different way. Rather than seeing them as an opponent to be defeated, you started to see in their own internal documentation, they began talking about how do we instead co-opt them as part, quote unquote, partners. So I I think that was smart. And, you know, it's really interesting too, when you see it in other countries where it's, the books are maybe more open. There was a large liberal foundation, for example, in Ireland that talked very openly about how they kept running into the wall of Christianity on Mm. the question of gay marriage there. And they said, the only way we're going to be able to do this is instead of trying to fight them, we get people in those churches moving this discussion and moving this agenda. And and I don't have the quote in front of me, but it wasn't like something they hid. It was, and, And in that case, it was the Catholic Church. They were saying, we have got to get people in Catholic churches as opposed to people who are just critical of Catholic churches. Mm. And so that's what they did. Megan Basham, you can find her work at The Daily Wire, dailywire.com, and book hopefully first part of 2024. Correct. That's right. So it'll have the same title, Bad Shepherds. Bad Shepherds. And more on X or Twitter at Meg Basham. Megan, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thanks so much. Up next, Stephen Nauman from Hillsdale's German department joins us. He'll take us on a brief tour of Germany and provide some tips and advice for those perhaps thinking about a trip. 
I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hillsdale College is a small, Christian, classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value. And nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, an 8 to 1 student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info. We're back on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. You can get an email every time there's a new episode of the show. Go to radiohour.hillsdale.edu and enter your email address. That's radiohour.hillsdale.edu. We're joined by Dr. Stephen Nauman, Associate Professor of German at Hillsdale College. Dr. Nauman, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Scott. Great to be here. Talking today uh, about visiting Germany and giving some tips and giving some ideas, which is which is fitting because, as you told me before we started, you actually, was it a major, like travel and tourism in college? Yes. Uh, yeah, I did some, a second undergrad degree at Western Michigan University and, and majored in German alongside of travel and tourism, which was, which was pretty neat. Just uh, it's always been something I've loved. Uh, I didn't know at that time what I wanted to do with German. In fact, you know, I tell my students this today, um, you know, never rule out teaching. It might be something you really find you love. But I actually went into a professor's office and and asked, um, I, I don't know what I want to do, but I really want to do something with German. So what can I do with German but not teach? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and lo and behold, you know, it, you know, years later in grad school, it sort of dawned on me like this is just this is what I want to do. And this is this is one of the great things you can do. I really enjoy it. So, so nice to be here. You're our travel guide today as we uh, trek a little <laughs> yes. bit across Germany. How often have you been to Germany? Where do you, where do you like to go? Yeah. So the first, the, my first opportunity to go to Germany was uh, when I was in high school. I went to a high school in Saginaw, Michigan Lutheran Seminary, and they had a program abroad. I got to spend a month traveling a, a, a little bit in Germany. We're two weeks in the Southwest in the Rhineland Pfalz. Uh, the region is called uh, the Rhineland Palatinate uh, in the Southwest beautiful, beautiful area. So that's sort of a place near to my heart. I spent a semester there later on and then got to go to Saxony. I have a lot of uh, friends there. My actually, my family, my family on my dad's side is, is from Dresden. So that's a, a city very near and dear to me. It's also a beautiful city. I definitely recommend visiting Dresden. It's sort of an art city, the Florence of the North um, in Germany. So um, if you're interested in art or sort of Baroque architecture, it's a, it's a great place to visit. Then I got um, to spend uh, a year abroad in Berlin, uh, which was 2004, 2005. And that was a year that really changed my life. It was Germany had just sort of started to get its feet underneath it since, you know, the fall of the wall and reunification. Um, and so they're sort of holding their own fate in their own hands as a unified country. Um, you know, 15 years underway and they had all these really fascinating decisions that were going on about, you know, monuments and how to remember things and how to, um, you know, things from World War II history and things from the Cold War. And, and uh, there were all these debates going on that the, the city was just <laughs> the national, you know, they talked about, you know, the, the bird of Berlin is the crane, sort of the crane, that the big metal cranes yeah. that are. Um, so there was a lot of um, <laughs> exciting monuments and construction projects going on at that time. And so Berlin's a place that I've, I've spent time every year since then. Um, and that's a, that's a place I love, but you know, really I don't <laughs> limit it to, to any one place. And so we can talk about some other spots as well that I, some favorites. So why do you think our listeners should consider visiting Germany? Perhaps they've even made the decision. All right, we're going to go overseas. We're going to go to Europe somewhere. What sets Germany apart from other countries nearby? Yeah. I mean, 
this is the, yeah, this is a great question and there's so many ways to answer it. It's, it's, there's such a, um, there's such a rich, you know, cultural component, whether you're talking about music or architecture or art, sort of the German ingenuity, if you're interested in sort of engineering or the business world, you know, transportation, anything like that, you know, the history is, you know, unparalleled, you know, some very so amazing moments and some dark moments, obviously in German history, the museums are, are outstanding. And just to see some of those things, um, you know, firsthand is, is invaluable. It's just, there's something about being in a place that helps you to understand history and, you know, the human experience uh, better. And Germany is one thing I think that makes Germany unique is its, is its history, you know, for a for so long, you know, along with Italy, it's one of the the late nations. Uh, there was really no Germany until 1871. And so for a long time, that's why German regional identity is very strong. It's not like France or Poland or the U.S. where the national identity is, is king. In Germany, you're, you know, you're a Bavarian or a Saxon or a Rhinelander first, hmm. and then you're a German. And so that's, you know, that's a result of, you know, centuries of of being part of this holy roman empire and so that's that's just a fascinating part of european history at, 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 as well and, and germany's been at the center of it and so you know in, in beyond just their contributions in all these areas uh, that i mentioned i think the the way um they're, they're really geographically and uh, in a lot of other ways sort of at the center of much of history so if you enjoy history um you know germany's a place place to visit but you know like i said the music, architecture, art as well. It's, 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 yeah, it's unparalleled. If people are considering a, a trip to Germany, are there, are there certain questions perhaps they should ask themselves before they make that decision? Yeah, I think, you know, some questions in the practical side of traveling is, is sort of where, I mean, it's just, it's not as, it's not a country that you can see. It's easy to get around in, but it's not a country that you can see you know, he, he, you, you have to go to these three cities in a week or something like that, or let's go to these six cities. I, I would say I try to encourage people to think that less is more mm-hmm. sometimes and, you know, save something for the next time. Try to, you know, uh, you know, if you're going for two weeks, maybe, maybe three cities or three sort of spots that you stay. And then you can get a little more out of that, get a, get a richer understanding of, of those places. And, and there's just such a, such a list instead of, you know, packing up your bags every day or two and, and <laughs> heading somewhere else. Cause there's so much to see. It can be overwhelming, but I would, I would try to regionalize it and, and say, okay, these are some play, these are some highlights and not to try to do everything at once. Another thing to consider is maybe train versus car. I think that's, uh, you know, Americans, you know, North Americans tend to ask that a lot. I, I always travel by train. It's so easy. There, there are a lot of ways to do it. It can be pretty affordable. And, you know, if you're comfortable doing that, um, it's, I think it's easier. Uh, gas is a lot more expensive there than it is here. And it's hard to park. And it's, I think having a car is sometimes a burden. Mm. <laughs> and uh, the, the other thing about German cities and we can talk about these in a bit. German cities are a lot different than American cities in that the center of the city is less industrial. It's more historical. They have, most cities have some sort of law or regulation that you can't build anything higher than the cathedral Mm -hmm. or the castle on the hill or the Rathaus or something like that. And so the skyline, as it were, is much more preserved. And with the exception of Frankfurt, which is sort of the German and European banking capital, there isn't this sort of glass and steel American skyline. And so what that has done is kept the center of the cities um, in Germany much more pedestrian friendly. And, and we've seen sort of a renaissance in certain cities in the U.S. or certain parts of certain cities, but the centers in Germany are, are much less industrial and they're just, that's the place you want to be most of the time as, as a visitor. And they're just, it's easy to get around in. And yeah, I think that's, so that's something to keep in mind. So, but you know, some people like to have, if you're going to certain places that are, you know, maybe not quite as accessible, you know, a car might be practical as well. So Dr. Stephen Nauman is with us, associate professor of German at Hillsdale College. He's our tour guide as we 
talk about visiting Germany uh, in this conversation. You, you, you talked a little about the, the bigger cities in, in Germany, and well, Berlin is the biggest. You've been to Berlin many times. How would, how would someone traveling to Berlin, say, find these differences between there and if they've been to New York City or been to Chicago, perhaps? Yeah. It, um, so Berlin is really interesting in that it's a city that grew very quickly in the 19th century. Um, I think around 1840, the city was maybe a couple hundred thousand people, 120,000 people. And 80 years later in 1920, it's 4.4 million or 4.3 million. And it's the, I think the third largest city in in the world, if I remember correctly. And so it just exploded. It's sort of like Chicago in that way. And uh, the, so the thing about Berlin is it's not as old as a lot of other cities in Germany um, some, uh, or Austria, for that matter. If you look at Vienna, Köln, Trier, you know, these are old sort of Roman colonies uh, that go way, way back. Frankfurt, München, uh, Nuremberg, there's a lot of cities that have, that were much more significant in the Middle Ages. And Berlin sort of came onto the scene later. And with German history as sort of Brandenburg and Prussia grew dumb during the late 18th and 19th century, Germany became, well, I'm sorry, Berlin was sort of the center of this northern entity that led to German unification or German unification, I should say, in 1871. You know, I think there's a there's a cultural critic in the late 19th century um, by the name of Karl Scheffler, who um, has a you know a great quote. He said, "Berlin ist immer verdammt, or Berlin ist dazu verdammt, immer zu werden und niemals zu sein," which means Berlin is sort of condemned always to become, always to be in the state of becoming, but never to be. And I think that's that defines Berlin. And you think about just the 20th century. I mean, that quote almost becomes prophetical. If you look back through those hundred years, you have all of those periods that, you know, maybe thought about the city in a certain way, started to build it in a certain way. And so it's, it's really a kaleidoscope of all of these visions. And so, yeah, I really like that quote for that reason. I think if you, if you enjoy history, Berlin is a place to visit um, for sure. It's uh, it's actually pretty inexpensive for a European capital because, you know, after the war, there was the Cold War and it's just sort of starting to pick up again and get, I mean, it's been trendy for a while, but the, the motto of Berlin was always arm aber sexy, which means sort of cheap, but sexy, cheap, but exciting, <laughs> cheap, but um, there's a lot to do there. There's mm-hmm. a lot to see. So it's unparalleled in that way, but it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not the authority that uh, you know, sort of a New York or a Paris yeah. or a London is. If people are interested in history, you were telling me that sometimes it's better to focus on some of the mid-sized cities than the larger cities in Germany. Yes, that, no, that's true. Um, so Germany um, is interesting too. I mean, there's 83 million people. It's the it's the biggest country population-wise in that that's wholly in Europe, so excluding Russia and Turkey, and and it's really well distributed. And so there are a lot of cities. There, there's not a giant city. Berlin's right. you know three four million people. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Ham- Hamburg's just under two, Munich's 1.3, 1.5. Um, but there are a lot of cities, about 500,000, 600,000, that are, that are just really culturally rich and interesting. You know, Nuremberg and Bremen and uh, Leipzig and Dresden and, you know, Hannover and Dortmund. And you can go on and on. There's, you know, a dozen of them. And so it's really distributed. But one thing that's interesting, too, um, because of, you know, because of World War II, um, much of Germany was was bombed from the air. And so most cities that are larger than 100,000 people were damaged significantly in the center. Um, now, a lot of that, most of that's been rebuilt. And, you know, those cities are very worth seeing. But those smaller cities that are under 100,000 are, are, those are some of my favorites. I think there's there's just a lot of hidden gems and you can see, you know, yeah, cities that go back to the Middle Ages the early modern period, there's, there's just a lot to see. So, you know, there's uh, university towns like uh, Freiburg is one of my favorite cities. It's in the southwest in the, the Black Forest um, region. It's a university town. Uh, there's, um, you know, Heidelberg is another favorite. Um, the oldest university in Germany, a beautiful, beautiful city in the southwest as well. Uh, Marburg is this sort of academic, old academic town. Um, 
Görlitz is on the German-Polish border, another city off the beaten path, but it just really thrived in the Renaissance era. And there are so many, you can do a walking tour there, and there are so many beautiful interiors of homes that they don't have that are just like Renaissance buildings, you know, thick walls and beautiful courtyards and ceilings that they say, you know, just walk into them, just Mm -hmm. pop in and people will invite you in, show you around. And, you know, there's not enough museums in that small town to, you know, (laughs) occupy them all. So people just live there. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of films that have been, you know, set in Europe and and shot in that city um, in recent years. But there's, you know, there's Greifswald and, and Lübeck in the north, you know, beautiful sort of Hanseatic um, cities uh, on the, on the um, Baltic Sea. You know, Weimar is a city with a lot of history and, and culture. Um, if you like literature, right, this is Goethe and Schiller. Um, Jena close by, there's a lot of thinkers there in the, in the 19th century um, in Germany, late 18th century philosophy, culture, um, romanticism, a lot of those things. We Americans make the decision to travel to Germany. Are there any uh, phrases or any American behaviors that perhaps we should avoid because they're not common or not acceptable in Germany? I wouldn't say um, anything that's not acceptable, but you know, some things that tend to make Americans stand out. Um, we we love to wear, you know, clothing, t-shirts, sweatshirts that show us like tell other people where we're from or mm-hmm. what school we went to or, or this or that. So that's sort of a, an American thing. Um, and I, I think Americans, you know, they sometimes have the reputation of being a little more friendly and outgoing in public and sometimes they're a little louder. So, you know, those aren't bad things, but they're just things that will get you recognized, yeah. recognized if you want to blend in a little more, um, you could be a little more subtle, but, uh, they're really, I mean, travel is just a great place to, to meet people and interact with people. And you'll find that Germans that, you know, if they find out, Oh, you know, you're from the U S that's, they're fascinated. Germans love reading the news. Um, they're very informed, um, and they're very curious and, uh, they love, I mean, I've had a lot of conversations where they just are picking my brain, you know, where, what about this or that, or this from American culture, politics, history that they're, and I, I think those, Those are some of the things that make travel so rewarding are those exchanges, those personal exchanges, um, you know, getting to know people. No matter where you go in Germany, are there certain foods, beverages, beers that (laughs) you've got to try? Um, Absolutely. I mean, (laughs) yeah, I I would start with the bakeries in Germany. Um, The bakeries are are unbelievable. So there's a law in Germany that prohibits supermarkets from being open on Sunday (laughs) um, or in the evening after a certain hour. I think it's 10 o'clock now unless it's attached to a train station. So you, you know, on Sunday, the only thing that's open are cultural places and restaurants and, 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 but bakeries. So bread is sort of holy. And, and there's a reason for that. The, the bread is just unbelievable. Um, <laughs> when I spend, the more I spend time in Germany, the more embarrassed I am about what constitutes or what qualifies as bread in the United <laughs> States. Um, and, you know, fortunately there are some good breads around, but they're not as ubiquitous over here, but you just walk into a German bakery and, uh, you know, if you haven't been in one before, it may change your life. Um, it's just, there's just, uh, there are so many delicious types of breads and rolls and it's just the centerpiece of the breakfast and the small supper that is part of German culture. By the way, if you stay at hotels, <laughs> don't miss the buffet. Um, <laughs> you, you can stay at sort of a, a modest sort of family run, Gasthof for sort of a, a pension sometimes, and they will. It, there is just a, a buffet that that I don't know. I I think the first couple times I stayed somewhere, my brother and I, we, we you know, it was like two three hours, and we're still like, well, we haven't tried everything at the <laughs> breakfast. So, you know, I think those are those are things that are, that are good. Obviously, the sausage, the cheeses um, are, are just amazing, and of course, every region has different variations of that. Um, and the beer, uh, as you mentioned, it's a it's a it's a you know, it's a beer country. Um, the beer is just such a part of the culture and, and there are so many different variations of that. I love the, you know, the alt beer from the Dusseldorf region. Um, Pilsners in the North are very, very good. Uh, Hefeweizen from Bavaria in the South or just a Märzen, like a, uh, like an Oktoberfest style beer from Munich are, um, that's the beer capital that those are amazing. You know, Hefeweizen is great in the, on a summer day. So besides the beer, the wine, um, 
the wine is is outstanding too in the south in the southwest and the mine region where Würzburg is located from a study abroad program there, and you know white wines are very good. Döner Kebab is a is an interesting um, sort of fast food thing that's everywhere in Germany because of uh, you know the Turkish German population. This is something that developed. It's similar to Greek like a euros, mm-hmm. but it's uh, it's something that the you know Turks developed in Germany using sort of German or Northern European vegetables with this Turkish concept. So that's a, that's pretty popular, but the cuisine is, is, you know, if you like, you know, cabbage and (laughs) sauerkraut (laughs) and red cabbage and, um, you know, great meats and things like that, you'll love Germany, but they also have a very diverse, um, menu and very, um, yeah, I think when I was in Berlin, I learned about a lot of different cultures, you know, Ethiopian and mm-hmm. Nepalese, and you can eat just about anywhere, and, and it's pretty affordable in restaurants in Germany. So, one final quick question for you: You told me before we started, your favorite German word is a word that essentially means uh, like longing for travel. So, uh, tell me about that. Yeah, so so there's a German word called das Heimweh, um, which means homesickness, pining for home, and we have that concept in English, right? Everybody, every every culture has a word for homesickness. Um, that's pretty ubiquitous, but. Germans have this word. It's my favorite word in the language. It's called Fernweh. So this is a pining for being far away, for being abroad. And, and part of, I think, <laughs> very cl- it's just indicative of the German soul. The German thinking is, is travel. They love the outdoors. Um, they love green spaces. They love being in nature. They love traveling. I think Germans travel... Um, more days out of their country per capita than any other country in the world. And so they are the kings of travel. And there's a healthy cycle that comes along with that. If you, if you travel and you go abroad, you're going to, then you're going to experience this homesickness, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a healthy thing. You want to, you miss where you're from. You miss your own home. You miss your own kitchen. You miss certain things about your own culture. You want to come back to those and you really appreciate them more. But if you stay there for 12 months, you know, you're going to get sick of them. And so Germans are really good at that. And so I think they inspire, they can inspire us to, to think that way and want to travel. And so, you know, I think their country is a great place to do that. Obviously, <laughs> Austria, Switzerland have a lot to offer as well, culturally, historically, and in terms of, of nature as well. So, um, but that, you know, think about that word, Fernweh, pining for travel, pining for being away and uh, associated with Germany. It's just one of many, 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 fascinating things you'll learn by traveling, engaging with the language and, and, and yeah, just seeing what's out there, exploring, and then you're going to appreciate coming back to where you're from. Dr. Stephen Nauman, Associate Professor of German here at Hillsdale College at our tour guide through visiting Germany. Dr. Nauman, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thanks so much, Scott. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to John J. Miller, head of the Dow Journalism Program at Hillsdale College, Megan Basham from the Daily Wire, and Stephen Nauman from Hillsdale's German Department. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. Remember, you can hear new episodes every week on this station. You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. The assistant producer of the program is Sam Lair. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. (laughs) 